Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship at Bethel United Methodist Church in Charleston, South Carolina. I'm Susan Leonard, thankful to be one of Bethel's pastors here as we share the journey of faith together. Bethel is a community of faith that sees itself as a school of love, where we are learning and practicing the ways of Jesus so that together, by his spirit, we may help earth look more like heaven. As we gather once more in this season of global pandemic, we are resilient people, creative people, learning how to care for one another beyond these walls, um, making gestures of care still out into the community through our food pantry, through our ministry with children and their families, youth and their families. Adult Bible study, last one um, of this series is this Wednesday night at 7, Zoom. Um, so if you would like to be a part of that and haven't been on the list, just simply email me and we'll... Um, We'll send you an invite that you might join us for this last week before we reset and um, uh, take another journey through another topic in the coming weeks. Today is a day that we celebrate the, the graduates among us. If we were gathered in this space, they would be with us uh, leading worship. And so uh, virtually they will be uh, gathering and helping us lead worship. There are five high school graduates today, which we will be hearing from and praying for in this service. And we are so grateful for their contribution to our worship life and our faith family here at Bethel. We have heard from our bishop, Bishop Holston, who released a statement on Friday that there will be across the state for United Methodist Churches no in-person gatherings until June the 14th. So that's another month that we are given to get our protocols in order. There's uh, material for us to think about, plan for, and make our spaces safe. So we at least have that first block of knowledge that, that there, there is no in-person gathering of any kind here in South Carolina United Methodist Churches until June the 14th. And again, we'll use that time to be uh, creative in our preparation and in our safety protocols that we might return here to continue this journey of faith. And my prayer is that we'll all return stronger for having um, sort of planted ourselves deep in the life of faith through this unprecedented time of pandemic. But for now, I invite you to join with me as we make that sometimes difficult but always necessary transition from getting here, getting to a place, a time of worship, and being here as we prepare our hearts through music to worship God.
Dear Lord, we thank you for today, for yesterday, and for tomorrow. During these uncertain times, minds tend to wander, becoming entangled in doubt, uncertainty, and anxiety. We pray that as each day passes, you continue to extinguish any worldly worry that we may develop and that you heal our wavering hearts, drawing us closer to you, and reminding us that with you, we will be strong. With you, we will be united, and with you, we will have no fear. Wrap us in your warmth so that we may spread your love to each person we encounter, and give us the courage to face each day boldly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <laughs> I'm a, my name's Daniel Beckley. I've been in the Bethel Church for as long as I can remember. <laughs> I've been raised up in this church since I was at least four years old. Um, my favorite thing about being in the church was I got dragged around to a lot of the uh, senior ministry events uh, when I was in middle school. And that really taught me how to kind of open up and be a more social person um and that whole experience has really helped me out in pretty much all aspects of my life whether it's from getting various jobs or getting through school um just having relationships with people in general it's taught me a lot and i'm really thankful for my church family and everything that I've learned from y'all. Um, it's been a great time growing up in Bethel and I'm so excited to take what I've learned there and apply it into the rest of my life as I go into the Air Force uh, coming up in just a few short months. Um, so thank you. Good morning, saints. Good morning, sinners. 
as we prepare our hearts and souls for prayer this morning. It is a special day at Bethel in that we celebrate uh, milestones in the lives of, of some of our, of our family members. It is graduate day, and as we prepare for prayer, we certainly want to remember and lift up uh, our high school graduates, some of them, you or all of them, you will be uh, uh, hearing from uh, during this time, or most of them, I'm sorry. Uh, Grayson Ellis uh, from Porter Goud, Ryan Lamantia from James Island Charter, Madeline Briggs from Ashley Ridge High School, Danny Beckley from Fort Dorchester High School, and William Pugh from Hanahan High School. The college graduates, and I, I truly hope that I have gotten the full list and that this is, is correct. Uh, Savannah Hine, University of South Carolina. Tess Linker, University of South Carolina School of Nursing. Um, Annie Cribb from Rhodes College. Emma Rogers from Clemson University, and Ann Rogers from Washington and Lee University, and Dr. Chris Reardon from the Medical University of South Carolina. Uh, we certainly want to congratulate them and lift them up in prayer uh, as they continue uh, to experience life in the midst of, of that which God leads them to do. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. In the still and the quiet, O oh God, we bow before you, hearts filled with thanksgiving for the abundance of your blessings to us, O oh Lord, are unending. as recipients, O oh God, of, of those blessings. We seek to be your people, seek to be true servants of yours, disciples of Jesus, and we seek, O oh God, to be the church you need us to be. May our mission and ministry, O oh God, in this community and beyond be acceptable in your sight and pleasing to you. May what we do, O oh God, be efforts to strengthen your kingdom here and in other places. Fill us with, with strength and conviction to live lives following Jesus. Fill us, O oh God, with your spirit that we might, might know your presence in every moment. Remind us, O oh God, this day of the words of the prophet Micah. who shared with us that we should love kindness and to do justice and to walk humbly with you. May our energies, O oh God, be given to doing just that that we might be the people you need us to be. The young people, oh God, we've mentioned this day are special in so many ways. They come to, to one of life's milestones 
with dreams and visions, plans and goals. We lift them up to you, O oh God. These graduates who, who look forward to a new day in the midst of, of uncertainty, O oh Lord, grant them your wisdom and grant them a clear vision of what it is you have in store for them. Now, gracious God, in these moments of sacred worship, fill our hearts with new faith and teach us to treat each other like we ourselves would want to be treated. These are our prayers, and we ask him in the name and for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, who has taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. I hope y'all are having a great day. The weather outside is beautiful, so I hope you get outside and play some. It's a little bit warmer than it was this time last Sunday we were together. Today, we're still talking about Jesus talking to his disciples and telling them what's going to happen after he leaves them on earth and goes to live with his Father, which is God. Today, I have three boxes here. Because one of the things Jesus said to his disciples in that last supper before he, was, he went to leave was that God would send a helper or a friend to help them carry on Jesus' work. And they were like, what? Jesus said, yes, God will send you a helper or a friend to help you with your work. So today, before we get started, I want you to see if you can help me find the gift that Jesus promised the disciples that he, that God would send. All right, I have three boxes, red bow, green bow, blue bow. All right, I'm going to move them around, and you tell me which one you think the gift is under. If you think it's under the green bow, thumbs up. If you think it's under the red, stand up. If you think it's under the blue, stay seated. All right, I'm going to move them around again one more time. Think about it. Where do you think the gift is? Think it's under red? Oh, how about green? No. Must be under blue. There it is. Here is the gift that Jesus promised God would send. Now you're going, what? A dove? Remember, the dove is a symbol, and a symbol is we use something to stand for something. The dove is the symbol of the Holy Spirit. And God promised and sent the Holy Spirit to live in our hearts so that we could carry on his work on earth. So the dove represents the gift that Jesus said that God would send. And we will talk in two more Sundays about when God sent this gift. But this was the gift that God sent to the, all of us on earth to help us carry his message and his love in his heart. 
and Jesus told his disciples that it was coming. And we really don't know if they really believed it or not, but in a couple of Sundays when we celebrate Pentecost, we will talk more about the Holy Spirit visiting and coming when God sent it. Boys and girls, have a great day. Let's pray prayer before we go. Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus to us on earth to give us an example of how we should live. And thank you for sending us another gift when he left to help us keep him and you in our hearts and help us show your love to others. And all of God's people say, Amen.
Gospel reading, John chapter 14, verse 15 through 21. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I'll ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him. Because he abides with you, and he will be in you, I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you in a little while. The world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. As we prepare to gather around this sacred scripture, let us open ourselves to God and to one another in these moments. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you that you did not stand at a distance, hoping that we would um, connect with you through the beauty of your creation. You knew that we needed something um, more, and in the fullness of time, we thank you for Jesus, who came to show us the way. We are followers of that way, and we bid you now come and lead us still as we journey further down the road of faith. In the name of Christ, we offer these and all our many prayers. Amen. So I know that a lot of us are um, living into the new of a pandemic. I think about my own journey uh, through these uh, recent weeks and months. And I think that if I re had to name my emotions, I would uh, say initially it was sort of, um, uh, there was this anxiousness, like a snowstorm is coming, one needs to go to the grocery store and get, you know, milk and bread or toilet paper. You know, there was that, we've got to gather things in for this coming pandemic. And so there was some anxiousness and um, energy. And then as the weeks have gone on, we've, um, if you're like me, you have sought to kind of develop a routine that gave order and purpose, even when we were um, distancing and um, living through the stay at home, stay safe season. And now that restrictions are opening up, um, there's the leaning forward into uh, how to prepare for what comes next. Not a return to the old, but now the coming reiteration of the new. A lot of that has been loss for a lot of people, certainly loss that I feel as a pastor in an empty sanctuary, um, the loss that I feel as a pastor when I can't go to the hospital to visit those who are in for surgery or recovering, loss with those families who must limit their gatherings to 10 when they come for a service of um, funeral. There's a lot of loss that we all have faced. But, but in the midst of that, there's been some real gifts. I've heard many of you say that, you know, if it weren't for the pandemic and people losing their jobs and people losing their lives, this would be a great season um, because it's allowed us to do some things as a family that, um, that otherwise we would not have been doing these last two months. So on that personal note, the, the quarantine has, has um, presented some losses, certainly to me, but has also presented some gifts. One of those gifts was that um, my son, Jonathan, who makes his home in LA while he's in law school, found himself distance learning, um, virtual classes, 
And in the midst of the pandemic, he and his roommate made their way to Charleston. Uh, Judah was with us for a couple of weeks and then made his way on home. And then Jonathan had the opportunity to be here some five weeks. Now, how, how often is it that, the, that a mama gets to spend five weeks with her adult son um, in a normal ebb and flow of real life? By the time our children launch, um, many of them circle back through for holidays, for family vacations, for uh, a long weekend, Mother's Day. But five weeks, sweet. Others of you have those same stories. But this past week, uh, we made our way to the Charleston airport. It was time for him to return to L.A. and to close out the chapter there of his second year and begin his work for the summer. And I found myself as uh, he got his luggage out of the back and we stood on the curb there at the airport. Um, we recounted how good it had been to be together. And, and in an embrace and a kiss on his cheek and a kiss on my cheek, he pulled away and I said, part of my heart will always be with you. And he said, part of my heart will always be with you. In our scripture today, I think that's kind of what Jesus is trying to say to his disciples. His fingers are still um, prune-like from washing their feet. They've been around the table recalling the Passover meal. As they recline, Judas has already left. And they have this long and lingering conversation about what it will be like when Jesus is no longer with them tangibly. These are words of reassurance. These are words of my, something of my presence, something of my heart is going to stay with you. These who are left around the table have been with Jesus for some three years. They have heard him speak um, to them in the everydayness of their life. Um, and he said to them over and over again, whether they've been at the tax collector's booth or on, um, the, uh, on the boat pulling in a net, he said, come, follow me. And anybody who says, come follow me, is more concerned about where we're going than where we've been. More concerned about the choices we will make than the mistakes we have made. More concerned about what's ahead of us than what's behind us. And they have joined him on the way. Come follow me. And what they found each in turn was that Jesus wasn't taking them to a place was calling them to a way, a way of life. When you think about it, the whole of our scripture, scripture story, the whole of our library of scripture has, it about, has about it this journey-like um, motif, beginning with Genesis 12, God calls to Abraham and Sarah and says, um, go to a place that I will show you. There is work for you to do. I will bless you so that then through you and your descendants, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Abraham and Sarah were invited on this journey. The other significant story that marks people uh, of faith in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, is the story of Exodus. The journey from slavery to freedom, the journey from um, this, this life in exile to this homecoming, and God's provision, a pillar of fire by night, and uh, clouds by day to lead them on their journey 
to the promised land. And then in the fullness of time, Jesus comes and says, come follow me, not to a place, but to a way, to a way of life. And for three years, they had been apprentices under Jesus. They had been um, part of his school, learning the ways and practicing the ways of Jesus. And over time, they had discovered that the end goal of that journey was that it was to a way of love. That, that's the ultimate journey, to a way of love. A love of God, a love of others, a love of neighbor, even a love of enemies. It was to a way of love. Now, I imagine if I um, said to you that this is the ultimate journey of our lives, this way of love, most of you, wherever you are on the spiritual journey, would, would say, yeah, yeah, that, I agree with that. That sounds good. That, the ultimate goal is to love and be loved. That, that's, the, that's the ultimate end goal, to love and be loved. But now, where does that come from exactly? Um, what, wherever you are on the journey, whether you are um, uh, pondering faith, whether you are um, um, dipping your toes in the water of faith, whether you are a lifelong follower and believer, whether you um, are um, de-churched, um, been here, done that, left, wherever you are, what makes us all pretty much agree that that's a true statement, that the end goal is to love and to be loved? Does that come from science? No. Science, for all its goodness, cannot give us that kind of life. Does it come from politics? <laughs> Heavens no. P politics, uh, electing whoever, will not give us that end goal. Um, even Eastern religions, good gifts though they have to give, do not ultimately lead to that goal. You, you think of the Buddha, um, wise, um, brilliant thinking, but the Buddha left family to go on a search for happiness and says the way to find happiness is through detachment. The way not to love is the way to keep from getting hurt. These and a thousand other paths do not lead us to the end goal. But Jesus knows the way. Jesus says as he gathers with his disciples on that Thursday night that I'm going and I'll not leave you orphaned. And if you've ever been a babysitter or perhaps you were the one whose parents were going out and you've been the one who has a babysitter, you kind of know how this goes, right? Um, I remember being a young child and, um, and my little sister, Amy, and mom and dad might be talking at, at lunch one day or at dinner one night about, you know, this, this coming Saturday night, it's the theater, so we'll be going, um, or it's, you know, we're going to be, it's our night for bridge or what, whatever. And I remember as a little child going, where, where are you going? When will you be back? And who will stay with us? Right? That's the question every child wants to know when their parents get ready to leave. Where are you going? When are you coming back? Who will stay with us when you go? And Jesus, for the first time in John's gospel, says, I, I am going to the Father. In a little while, I'll be back. But I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, 
Holy Spirit who will be with you always. He wants them to know he's going. And while they cannot see or touch him physically, there will be a gift for them that will comfort and guide and direct the rest of their journey. There's a Belgium theologian that um, was asked out of all the scripture that we have in our library of, of faith, what story best captures this um, cultural moment in which we find ourselves? And without hesitation, he said, um, the story of the road to Emmaus. Remember it? It's, it's the first day of the week. The women have gone to the tomb early, have reported that Jesus was not there. They encountered messengers. Mary um, discovers him in a conversation um, in the garden. These two, these two, um, at first, are unnamed. Scholars think they are probably a couple, male and female. Uh, they they don't have names, which means that your name goes there and my name goes there. This is our story. Every man, every woman. They've encountered this disappointment. This they they had hoped that Jesus was the one, and they are leaving the center of faith, Jerusalem, and they are walking back to Emmaus when this unknown one comes among them and asks them, what are you talking about as you journey on the way? And they say, do you not know? Are you the only one that doesn't know the things that have happened? Jesus says, what, what things? And they tell him about this Jesus of Nazareth, who was strong in word and deed, who seemed to have the power of God in his life, who um, loved so unguardedly, who um, was a transformative person. They had hoped he was the one. But now with a sense of melancholy, a sense of um, loss, um, a sense of aimlessness, they, they make their way back to their home. Jesus, of course, reveals himself to them um, in the breaking of the bread and in the lifting of the cup. And as soon as they know it's him, he vanishes from their sight. And they say to one another, weren't our hearts burning within us when he talked with us on the road? Weren't our hearts burning? Yes. Yes, because Jesus says before he leaves, I am going, I will come again, but who will stay with you? Holy Spirit will stay with you to comfort you, to guide you, to set your hearts on fire, to lead you down the path of love. It's as if Jesus is saying to them, I may be going, but part of my heart will always be with you. And because part of my heart will always be with you, you will have everything you need to continue the journey of love. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.